So whenever he passed that way, he would stop there for a meal. She said to her husband, Look, I am sure that this man who regularly passes our way is a holy man of God. Let us make a small roof chamber with walls and put there for him a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp so that he can stay there whenever he comes to us. One day when he came there, he went up to the chamber and lay down there. He said to his servant Gehazi, Call the Shunammite woman. When he had called her, she stood before him. He said to him, Say to her, Since you have taken all this trouble for us, what may be done for you? Would you have a word spoken on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? She answered, I live among my own people. He said, What then may be done for her? Gehazi answered, Well, she has no son, and her husband is old. He said, Call her. When he had called her, she stood at the door. He said, At this season, in due time, you shall embrace a son. She replied, No, my Lord, O man of God, do not deceive your servant. The woman conceived and bore a son at that season, in due time, as Elisha had declared to her. Shall we stand for the reading of the gospel, please? Or we sit our age? That is special for God's word to us. Now, it, now as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which shall not be taken from her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, it's good to uh, be back with you again, and I have enjoyed uh, worshiping uh, with you on occasion. Uh, but it's, you may remember that uh, I'm a retired Presbyterian pastor. I was ordained in 1972, have served the three congregations, uh, most recently 33 years at the Howdy Trove Presbyterian Church. Um, and Roberta and I worked there together, and kind of, she took it upon herself as a task to get me out from behind the pulpit and down with the people. And she didn't make me take my robe off, but I know that she and, and Pastor Bill are in accordance about the preachers being down with the people. And, but I, you know, for 40 some years, this is where I have preached from. And I'm just a lot more, more comfortable there. Uh, but, uh, you know, having been a long time pastor and now being retired uh, gives me an opportunity to think back on uh, some of the memories of my pastorate. And I, one, one thought that came to my mind recently, I was remembering when I was calling on an elderly uh, member of the congregation, a woman. And she invited me into her home, and I, I sat there in the overstuffed chair, and, and we were chatting, and there was a, a bowl of peanuts uh, right there. And I absolutely-mindedly started eating those peanuts. And before you know it, I had, re I had eaten the whole bowl of peanuts. And so I apologized to her. I said, I'm so sorry. I've eaten all of your peanuts. And she said to me, oh, it's no problem. I've already sucked off all the chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> the Reverend William Willowman is also a, a retired pastor. He was uh, the presiding bishop uh, in the uh, United Methodist Church for a long time. And that uh, 
Marie Banks of here is, uh, is a long time Methodist. So Marie William Willimon is one of the great preachers uh, of our of our country. Uh, and, and so I hold him up. An interesting thing about Marie you may not know is that for 76 years she was the organist of her church in uh, Alberta, Michigan. So um, that kind of uh, uh, dedication uh, and, and uh, stick to itness and uh, faith is, uh, is proper to that is something that we can all admire. But I, I over the years, have enjoyed teasing her about being a Methodist amongst all us Presbyterians. <laughs> but uh, Reverend William Willowman, like I said, was a, a presiding bishop. And before that, he was dean of the chapel at Duke University and a great preacher. So he was uh, often asked to travel around the country uh, preaching and speaking at uh, different events. Uh, and I found, it, uh, I found interesting his description of what happened to him during one of his travels. And, and this is what he writes. He says, a few weeks ago, I was to go uh, to speak at the Lutheran Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. So I took the last flight out of Vera. We landed late. A hair-raising $50 one-hour cab ride later, and I was deposited at a now utterly dark, locked-up type Lutheran Seminary. Had no idea where I was supposed to sleep. He wandered says, I wandered about Willie Loman like, remember Willie Loman from Death of Salem, wandered about Willie Loman like, bag in hand, trying this door and that, everything locked and dark. Midnight. He writes, finally I saw one last light in a house on campus. In desperation I knocked on the back door. A woman came, peered out. I told her who I was. She invited me in. As it turned out, her husband was the only person that I knew at the seminary, John Van Orsdow, the president. He wasn't home, but Pat graciously fed me, got me to where I was supposed to be. It's great to be, he writes, it's great to be on the receiving end of hospitality offered to a stranger. She, she wrote, or she said, I don't usually open the door at night when John is away, said Pat. It's a tough neighborhood, but you look harmless. And he writes, I am. As a Methodist preacher wandering around Philadelphia at midnight, I am harmless. But if you are a woman, be careful how you open your door to strangers. It's not always great to be on the giving end of hospitality. The Advent season uh, that uh, is now passed for us began with two women, Elizabeth and Mary, opening the door to a stranger, to the angel Gabriel, who told them, each of them that they would give birth uh, to John the Baptist and to Jesus, respectively. So, we had the woman who invited me into her home for a conversation. I wasn't a stranger. The woman who invited William Willimon into her home, he was a stranger. She offered hospitality. Uh, Elizabeth and Mary. And so that brings us to our scripture lessons for today. Stories about women who opened their door to strangers and got surprised. First off, there was this wealthy woman over in Shunem. Now, any time the prophet Elijah happened to travel through town, she invited him over for a fried chicken, mashed potatoes and gravy, and jello. It's right there in the Bible. And she said to her husband, this is a real prophet, this bald-headed man of God, who's always stopping by for lunch. Let's build him a special room so he can stay here whenever he wants. Well, Elisha loved the room so much uh, and as much as he loved her cooking. 
So he says to her, I want to repay you for your hospitality. Make whatever it is that you need, and it's yours. Well, I told you she was rich. So she tells Elisha, thanks, but she's well fixed and doesn't need a thing. What on earth can I give to a woman who's got everything? Elisha asks his servant. Well, says the servant, she's got no son, and although her husband is a rich man, he's old. Great idea, says Elisha. Call her over, and I will give her the good news. And then he says to her, all this season, when the time comes around, you will embrace a son. I'll embrace what? She said, <laughs> as she kind of turned up the volume on her hearing aid. Young man, do you know how old I am? Have you seen my husband? Who said I even wanted a son? Well, nine months later, the Thursday afternoon book club really had something to talk about. <laughs> so the moral of the story, be careful about being nice to prophets. <laughs> a cup of tea, perhaps, a light lunch, but be wary of overnight sleep. <laughs> and then there were a couple of sisters over in Bethany. Mary, who loved to sit around and talk about great ideas, and Martha, who loved to throw great big dinner parties and make cakes from scratch. Now, Jesus was on the road traveling, and Martha invites him over for a big meal. Remind you of the Shunammite woman? Now, put Jesus' visit with Martha in context. The story of Jesus' visit to Mary and Martha comes right after the parable of the Good Samaritan. <coughs> now, remember our geography. Up here is Galilee and the city of Nazareth where Jesus spent most of his time. Below that is Samaria. And the people of Samaria were absolutely hated by the Hebrews. Uh, they, I don't even know how you could compare it today to, to, to Mexicans or Syrian refugees or something. They were just absolutely hated uh, by uh, them. And then below Samaria was uh, Judea, uh, which included Jerusalem uh, and Bethlehem. So a man is on his way to Jericho. Jesus tells a story, and he falls among thieves. And they beat him up and they leave him for half dead. Now, two men go down the road, a priest and a very pious lay person, and they both pass by this unfortunate uh, traveler without help. A Samaritan, a lousy Samaritan, was the only one who stopped and helped the suffering stranger, receiving him, bandaging him, risking his own life for the life of the wounded stranger. Go do likewise, Jesus says Jesus. So maybe Mary had heard that story of the Good Samaritan and took it to heart. So here is Jesus on the road. Come on over to our house, she says. In two hours I will whip you up the best kosher meal you ever ate. <coughs> See, Martha is doing what Jesus told her to do. She has gone and done likewise, received this hungry, needy stranger into her house. And she's in there working like a dog. And this is before the days of Kenmore or Cuisinart, remember. But there's her sister Mary, lounging at the feet of Jesus as he explains to her some of the finer points of the Nicene Creed. Well, hey, says Martha, kind of wiping her dishpan hands on her apron. Jesus, how about telling that egghead sister of mine to get in here and help? Go do likewise. Remember, Jesus? Wrong, Martha, says Jesus. Settle up. Let's, let's talk. Doing is okay, but there's much to be said for doing nothing. 
for listening. Mary knows I'm not just passing through town on the way to Jerusalem. I'm on my way to Calvary, passing through life to death. A few weeks and I'm out of here for good. Then you'll need the word more than food. Your fresh baked rolls are great, Martha, but as they say, you can't live by bread alone. Now, he spoke these tough words to busy Martha just a few verses after he took his sharp left down towards Jerusalem. The strange man of God whom Martha invited to dinner has a cross on his back. Once more, opening your door to Jesus, asking him in, is not just a matter of fixing up a few nice things for the preacher. It's a matter of Martha taking up her cross as well. Remind you of Elisha and the Shunammite woman? Open your door to God. You might get surprised. God's intrusions are rarely harmless. Look, all I wanted was a little food, polite conversation. What she got was a trip from the geriatric ward to the maternity ward. <laughs> Look, Jesus, we were supposed to have a nice evening. A little activism, a collection of canned goods for the less fortunate, old clothes for the poor. You have to go and spoil everything by this depressing cost of death. How much is the total going to cost me anyway? Open your door to God. Okay? Just remember, this is a real God, not some make-believe image of ourselves, not some tame deity you can have over for a chat, break bread at the table, break bread at the table of the living God. And you don't know how you will be surprised. You know, that Shunammite woman was a lot like us. She was well fixed, yes. Well fixed can be well fixed. <laughs> the diamonds were nice and that spring cruise but at her age with no child, which for her meant no future, about all she could do was to settle in to what is. Redecorate the den, add on a wing for that nice new young creature. Her life was fixed. Then she opened the door to that bald prophet and finds out that Reverend Elisha is more of a man of God than she ever expected. And he gives her more than her heart's desire. Some gift she could not dare to ask for because she could not dare to conceive it possible. God's presence intrudes, not always bringing what we ask for, but what God knows we need. Martha opened the door to similar divine intrusions. Now, conventional rabbis did not go to a single woman's house, much less waste their time in teaching women. Jesus makes Mary and Martha disciples. Jesus will not spoon-feed spoon them, patronize them with uh, innocuous religious platitudes. He gives them the truth of his way to them with both barrels, even though it be truth that is that is ambiguous and not easily defined, much less easily lived. Get out of the kitchen. Listen. Learn. Follow me, he says. Martha, like the Shunammite woman, the Shunammite sister, also receives the gift. But like that given to the woman of Shunam, not the gift that Martha expected. She, with Mary, is taken seriously, given the opportunity to be a full disciple of the one who proclaims the intruding, barrier-breaking, living God. Be careful to whom you open your door and whom you invite to sit at table. 
I wonder if in your life right now there is a knock at your door. I wonder, and I'm just asking, if where you are living right now there's a stranger outside waiting for you to open up. That tug at the heart, that tap on the door, it could be you know who. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, he said. Let's go ahead and let him in. You want to ask him in? What harm could it do? Amen.